to the second chapter of the second general epistle of Peter. I want to read verse 1 and 2, verse 4, verses 9 through 11. And as a companion scripture, I'd like to read Romans 13 and 11. And I will not keep you very long. But I do want to get this very familiar passage of scripture to you. Third chapter, second Peter. This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Verse 4, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Verses 9 through 11. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise. That's the singular, not plural. Most people quote that the Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Well, it's all right, but that's not exactly what it says. What the Lord has promised, he's also able to perform. But the apostle is not talking in the plural because he's talking about one particular promise. As some men count slackness, but his long-suffering to us were not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Now there's a lot of sobering verses to be found in the scripture, but this is one of the most sobering verse to be found in all of scripture. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Companion scripture, Roman letter 13, 11. And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is your salvation, or one contemporary version says final deliverance. Now is your final deliverance, or now is your salvation nearer than when we believed. God does not sow seed. God does not water. God does not harvest. God gives the increase. It's not personality, but it's the person, Christ Jesus. It's not Paul, it's not Apollos, it's not Cephas, but it's not personalities, regardless of personality, persuasiveness, charisma. It's not personality, it's the person, Christ Jesus. It's not the messenger, it's the message. Another thing that's alarmed me as we've come through the years is we see so much that is a display. I long to see the day when people will do and act and conduct themselves because of who and what they are. That they'll not take the place of God. You know, I was brought up as a, as a young boy to think we were so churchy that, uh, you know, you, you got into the body of Christ by covenant or the right hand of, the fellowship, of, right hand of fellowship. But of course, a uh, long time we've learned that but by one spirit are you all baptized into one body. Whether you be Jew or Greek or bond or free. Man has nothing to do with getting you into the body of Christ. It's a work of the spirit. And the perfect identity of the body of Christ is known to God alone. We only know them as it is revealed to us in the Spirit. I said all that to say this. 
We are the messengers of God. We have a message. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God into salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew and also to the Gentile. So there's power in the message. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It's a crushing hammer. It's God's revelation to man. It's our roadmap to heaven. So it's important. We are just mere messengers. And that's what I believe the Apostle Peter is saying here. He said, I find it needful to write to you again. He says, I have written to you in my first epistle, even though he doesn't say that, but in essence he says, I wrote to you about grace. I wrote to you about unity and love. I wrote to you about holiness. But he says, now I find it needful to write to you again. There's just some things you place priority on and there's some things that needs to be repeated. And he repeated some things, particularly in this promise. He says, I find ur urgency and I find uh, uh, the passion for obedience. Oh God, help us to feel constrained and motivated to obey the Great Commission and to love souls and to preach the gospel and not let anything come between us and one primary purpose, and that's to live good, love God, and preach the blessed Word of God. Now, I might sound a little hard, but... I'm not really, if you don't believe it, ask my wife. But you see, a lot of people, they base doing God's will on how much it pays and where it is. And I don't want to appear that I am holier than thou, but if it's God's will for you to do something, Personally, I would feel condemned if I knew it was God, if I based whether or not I go or do on how much it pays. And one person says, I'll go anywhere God wants me to do or go just so it's 40 miles from Tampa. Now, God's not in a thousand miles of that. I don't know about you, but I believe in theocracy. I believe there's a divine plan. God has designs on our lives. And he can see around the bend. And he orders our steps. And he charters our course. And I'm here to tell you I'm interested in finding that particular place in the work of the body of Christ. And the apostle is saying here, it's not personality, it's the person, it's not the messenger, it's the message. And he says, I'm coming to you again, that I may stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. Are you having trouble in remembering? Well, I am more so than ever before. When I traveled in itinerary work, deputational work, uh, I remembered where they pastored. I remembered their names. But the, you know, the secret of it was I was going back year after year and I loved them and worked with them and kept up with them. But now that I'm not going quite as often, I'm having trouble with where they are. Of course, preachers, you know, changing some of them about every three months. How in the world can you keep up with them anyway? And that's the, mo that's the greatest deterrent to church growth. When we can learn to content ourselves in whatever state we're in and find that here is a green pasture and it's not through the fence over there it's any greener, but oh, a challenge and a place to minister without looking somewhere else and the devil is there just as well as where he is and God's with you and will not forsake you and let that be as it may. But I'm having problems with remembering. Now, I used to be uh, better than I am now. It used to be that Sister McLean tell me to go to the store. And I say, baby, just tell me what you want, you know, and, and I'll bring it back and I wouldn't write it down. 
But anymore, I throw letters at the front door. It's either step on them or pick them up. So I pick them up and carry them and mail them. My wife puts a little magnetized grocery list on the Frigidaire door to milk and butter and cheese and what have you. And, and uh, she writes out me a long list because I can't remember it anymore. And she gives me the list and I forget what to do with the list. And, and uh, anymore, I could pretty well remember day by day, but I have a secretary now that's supposed to remember, and she does a good job just hour by hour. Either somebody's coming or somebody's going to call, and I've got to be jogged, and I have to, to remember. So the apostle is saying here, now I've got to write to them again. You see, we're just like a secretary, and, and I have two of them, and I dictate a lot of letters, and I put a lot of them on a transcriber and a dictaphone machine. But you see, they're good, and I can give it to them as fast as I want to, and they'll take it down. Well, that's what God is. He's dictating a letter. He's dictating a message. And the apostle was a mere secretary, and as God dictated, he wrote it down. And he says, I'm writing to you. I feel urged in the spirit. I've got a passion for obedience. God's got a message on my heart. I want to repeat to you. I want to tell you again. I'm writing to you again, beloved, that I may stir up your pyramid minds by way of remembrance Hallelujah. we've got everything going for us but time <laughs> time oh swiftly passing by you know I've known some of you for 30 years and uh, some of you were active in youth work but uh, now you're overseers and, and you're older and your hair's uh, like Tom Grissom is white and, uh, and I can't boast about that because at least he's got hair and I don't have near as much and, and time is just swiftly passing by you know the uh, brother and sister uh, the overseers got five grandchildren uh, brother and sister Raven and a lot of us got grandchildren and time is passing by and we can try to excuse ourselves if we want to but there's some things we better not forget there's some things that demand priority now you say oh yeah that's the mission for you you know but they've discredit anything else and just one way to go you better believe it you can discredit everything and you tell this world tell anybody that Jim McLean told you that our primary concern and interest and ministry should be the Great Commission God's called us for one thing and that's to witness and to work and to carry this gospel to the world Praise God. It doesn't make any difference their position in society. I get perturbed, I'll put it. That's a pretty good word. You know, of somebody that's got money in a congregation that demands and monopolizes your time. I don't care if he's got a million dollars. If he is uh, one a lamb or a sheep in my congregation where I'm shepherd he's just equal with all the rest regardless of how much money what kind of position he holds in the secular world or how much ties he pays he'll be treated as well and good as everybody else doesn't make any difference you know sometimes I think we've stood at the door not literally with a sword and say, unless you smell like I smell, and you look like I look, and you act like I act. But it took you years for you to come to where you are in life. And I don't care if they've got hot pants on. and Tell them I said so. They're welcome in the house of God. I don't care their color or how poor or how poorly dressed. Of course, I don't like that. You know I don't. But I believe if I can get the gospel to them, God will change them. And they can see the difference in our attitude and in our love. 
The love of God constraineth and oh, we can turn the world upside down if we live good and love God. Praise be to Jesus. Whosoever will, let them come to the house of God. They may not they may be a pygmy in the sight of God. They may be a babe. They may be uh, still on milk. But how long has it taken uh, to get you where you are? But with understanding and with love and nurturing, that person will come to know them as a full disciple of Jesus Christ. He says, I'm here to tell you. I'm here to stir up your pure minds. I want you to remember, don't project yourself. It's not personality. I would to God that somehow we could get the job done without even being visibly seen. You know, these signs shall follow them that believe, not just the preacher. I believe if somebody comes in sick and afflicted and sits in the pew, that if we're close enough to God and the worship service goes on, that some by his divine intervention, you'd lay hands on that person and you'd pray for him as worship service goes on and signs, wonders, and miracles would be the norm in the church of God. But there's a lot of people who want to get in a line. I'm not against healing lines, anointing with oil. But you see... If Jesus Christ is a true vine and you're the branch, you don't have to have somebody to anoint you with all. You may be somewhere where you can't get to the elders of the church. I was in Reno, Nevada one time before we had a church and you couldn't prove to me that I didn't have a heart attack. I'd never felt it before and haven't felt it since. But I had a pain that hit me. It went to my fingers. I was lying there in the travel lodge. I said, my God, have mercy on me. No one in the city knows where I am or who I am. My wife doesn't even know where I am. And just as sure as I stand here, the 15th chapter of John's gospel came to me. Jesus Christ, the true vine, and ye are the branches. And oh, we can be the recipient of all his redemptive blessings. Oh, the rich resources of Calvary. Oh, my blessed God. He's the supplier of all of our needs. Everything he is, we are. My, we lie there. We stand there. And we draw from the rich resources of Calvary. My God, help us to appropriate such faith. Yes. Better not forget it. We've done everything in the world to try to get people healed. One person said, I'd get up there, but uh, the person will hit you in the head and knock you out. I've seen bloody noses. I've seen bro broken bones. I've seen them stacking them up with cordwood. I've seen dresses fly up with women. God's not in a thousand miles of it. I believe what God does is going to be done for edification, for the uplifting. It's going to be the power of God. Just because somebody falls out, the whole crowd's not supposed to fall out. Somebody just builds up in their mind. Well, if it takes that to get it, maybe I'm supposed to do the same thing. Well, I'm not saying that you won't. Don't go away and say that you don't. I don't know. I believe what God does is decently in order. If God's in it, then Jim McClain's not going to say anything about it. But I'm here to tell you, I believe there's a better way. And I believe God knows that way. And I think we need to be reminded what we need basically in the church of God more than anything else. It's not another program. It's not another committee. We need the power of God and a book of Acts ministry to carry this gospel to the world. Yes. I just believe that when God touches your life, you're not going to forget. I just believe when God touches your life, you're going to be different. I believe when God touches your life, you're going to pay your tithes. I believe when God touches your life, you're going to give an offering, and you're going to give alms, and you're going to support the great commission of getting this gospel to the world. Would it surprise you if I told you one of the largest Churches in the church of God gave $45 last year for missions. 
and you think that we've got all kinds of money down there in headquarters and it's true we may have some money on savings but it doesn't belong to us it's project money that hasn't all come in it's it's uh, missionary savings it's uh, money that's not accessible to us our checking account is very limited we, we've got to hold some things till it's called for and it's true we have it on CDs getting interest that's the way it operates and people need to understand that but you don't pay my salary that is donor money it goes 100% to the field what I uh, get my salary out of is a two and a half percent that's administrative cost and it covers other costs as well so you see what you give goes 100 percent to the field god help us my blessed god god wants us not to forget his work and program of getting the gospel to the world now i've talked about personalities now i've talked about it's not so much the messenger it's the message now we started it and I guess we have to keep it up but I would be very happy if the time came when we just do something for God and not expect anything in return I'll be frank to tell you now I may not be speaking your sentiments but bear with me I, I have a right to my feelings I don't care whether they call my name or give me a plaque or win a trip, I don't care. I want to do something for God. It'll surprise you some letters I get at, at, at Cleveland. They call me everything but a Christian because they didn't get credit for $5. When can we just open up and say, I'm doing what I'm doing is because I'm a I'm doing, I don't care, you know, I'm, I'm trying to win souls. Praise, God. Oh, God. <laughs> Praise be to God that I can just hide behind Calvary and the cross and I have a passion for obedience and I'm compelled by love and I'm holy because he is holy and I want to win souls. I want to live like Jesus, act and conduct myself like Jesus, have the ministry of Jesus fill uh, with the Spirit of God to go into every place possible. I don't care whether they're ragged or poor or stinking. They got a never dying soul that needs to know that God loves them. He says, I'm telling you, don't forget it. It's easy to forget. I live. 
Praise be to God. Don't forget it. It's not personality. It's not self. It's others. And I want to end by giving you this little illustration. It's not so much the messenger. It's the message. My dad was a Church of God preacher, died a Church of God preacher. It wasn't but the last three or four years of his life that he owned a little house. And I was his pastor in Atlanta, Georgia. He's been dead some 20 years. But he had a green thumb. He wouldn't have a lot of talent. He couldn't hardly paint. Instead of smearing on, he'd kind of poke it with a brush, and it just looked horrible. My mother says, no, you can't paint. I'll do the paint. So he'd go to the yard. But he'd make a shack of a house, and the yard and flowers looked beautiful in a few months' time. So he bought a little old shack of a house and paid $4,000 for it, and he beautified the outside of that while my mother smeared on a little paint, and he sold it for $8,000. He took that $8,000, and he bought him another little shack and my mother smeared on some paint and my dad beautified the outside and he sold it for 16000 And when he died, he had a little house and it paid for it. My dad never bought me a bicycle. You know what, nowadays it's Hondas, or Yamahas and cars, but you know the ultimate back when I was a child is that someday we'd have a bicycle. My dad was too poor, he couldn't even buy me a bicycle. At the beginning of World War II, the only thing that made this job attractive was the fact that it furnished a bicycle. And they put an old sitting in green uniform on me, and a cap that's too big had it been for my ears while I couldn't see where I was going. My face was full of freckles back then, always had unruly hair. They put leather leggings around my legs, and on one pocket it said Western Union. And I pedaled that bicycle all over Atlanta, Georgia, street cars and traffic. And this brother Carl Hart gave a similar illustration last night. But back then, there's a Western Union boy in World War II. But, uh, you know, we don't have those anymore, so it was a, uh, a Navy chaplain that brought this death notice that you was telling us about last night. But I carried the death notices back beginning of World War after Pearl Harbor. And there were a number of times I've seen women cry, nervous, scream, Husbands tried to console. He had lose the composure when I carried the message from the President of the United States. Sorry to inform you, gave name, rank, and serial number that your son was either missing, wounded, or been killed for either South Pacific, European theater. I remember you, and I don't know why I remember that, but God brought it to my memory not too long ago. I remember saying, hearing a mother say what an investment and what a loss now you got to think about that a little bit is it a possibility especially we preachers that we place priorities and we place up here at the top of the list and we could invest a lot into what we're doing and it not be something that would remain. It would be a loss. It's altogether possible. Now, when she said this, then I read a lot into it. Of course, she did say, but I read a lot into it. All right, mothers, uh, any mother here, think about all the suffering of bringing a child in the world. And my wife, had a lot of problems, and, but we did have two children 14 months apart. And I'm not the handy person in the house, and I've told my wife I'm sorry. I put her through a lot of things that she really didn't deserve. I just wasn't a house man, that's all. And I've seen my wife put babies on her stomach while she would lie there in bed flat of her back. And she had pushed the, the bed, an old bed, iron bedstead, she had pushed it with her toes and caused the bed to go up and down. And here would be a baby with earache or sore throat or high fever or 
diseases, commutable to diseases, So finally, I'd just get all that I could take with the bed going up and down. I'd just get out and leave it with her. But it was my job to wash diapers. They had, didn't have disposable diapers. And I had an old ringing, uh, ringer washing machine, an old Maytag, and I'd use the bathtub to rinse them. If I could see all the diapers that this preacher has washed at one time and hang them on the line and we did we didn't have a dryer all the diapers you could see at one time they'd reach from here to Cleveland Tennessee raising a family taking care educating what an investment and all of a sudden killed on the battlefield what a loss Have you thought about it? In all that we do, in all the busyness, and all... You know, I, I don't know where to say it or not. Well, I better not. We've had, well, I'll say it this much. We had a preacher so conscientious about his visits. Is it because it, our name would be in the state paper? But is it because that God called us to pray for the sick? Is it advancing our own cause or is it for the cause and one purpose of extending the work of the kingdom of God? You see, we just place so much priorities on while we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. But the things which are seen are temporal. But the things which are not seen, they're eternal. That's, we're interested in not so much what is seen, but eternal things. How we place so much priority up here. And would come down to the end. What an investment. And it doesn't amount to anything. Oh, what an investment. And yet, what a waste. Now, I've often thought you to go back to any of those places. Who was it that brought you this message? Was it a little boy in a green uniform that the uniform was too big? Oh, I didn't pay particular attention. What about was his face full of freckles? Oh, I didn't notice. What about his unruly hair? Did it just go every direction? I didn't notice even what color his hair. You see, it was not the messenger. It was the message. Now, we're not to criticize people, but we can, we can't even judge people, but we can judge this book. Put it out there. We can judge it. Compare it. And in essence, the Apostle Peter is saying, the prophets told us. I heard him say it himself. The Lord is not slack concerning this one promise. The only thing that really matters, he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now listen, pastors, now I'm not putting you on, you know I love you and you love me. You don't lie. Denny Lane loves me and I love him. And I love all of you. Tom Grissom, John Gilbert does make any difference. I know you. Boggs, I know you. Either my antenna is turned wrong or I'm dead, and I'm not dead, and I'm still sensitive to the Spirit, and you're not lying. You love me, and I love you. 
but our priorities better, better be in its right place. Everything we do must revolve around the Great Commission. We may come down to the end, and I'll say again, we have everything going for us but time. And this gospel is good news only when it is heard. And I pray this coming year will be the greatest year that you have done in your church. And I want you to speak for your church. You're the thermostat in your church. And we don't have any trouble too much out of church and, and pastor's council. The trouble we have is the, the shepherd. So goes the council. We just say what we need to do, brethren, and let's pray and fast about it and put on a program and let us do something for, toward world evangelism. And, and you're the thermostat, and you set the temperature and the pace of your church, and they're going to live with it, and you're not going to hear too much grumbling. I find if there's any grumbling, complaining, they're just echoing what they've heard the preacher say. And the pastor is the door. And listen to this, the pastor is, and as you know, the shepherd that's interested in productivity. He'll guide, guard, direct, lead. He'll have a citadel of safety and of hope. And because he's interested in their health and their welfare and how well they get along, because you know what ultimately he is interested in? reproducing themselves and growth. He knows that they're going to have some lambs and they're going to bring along the wool. And if you're interested in that, then will you go back to your church? Don't wait for a mission representative, but put in motion a program for this next 12 months that'll bring about that desired results. And you'll remind them and you'll want just God and nothing else. And I want you, if you will, please, Pastor, look at that faith promise card. We'll get some of the sheet later on, but I'm just interested in you, pastors, please. Now, if you were going to sell your congregation on a building program, I know exactly what you'd do, and you would too. But I am so, I am so taken up with this that I'm like, is it C.E. Grogan or S.E. Grogan, North Carolina? Preacher, retired, S.E.S. -E -E Grogan. Has written a number of songs. Beautiful man. Before he built the church in Roanoke Rapids, he said God spoke to him that before they did anything, they had to give $1,000 for world missions. And that grew into a great mission-minded church. I know I went to Kannapolis and that old dirty, dingy place with curtains. It was such a gross looking building. I'd been accustomed to a new building in Atlanta, but I looked at that congregation. I said, we'd like to do something for the auditorium, but let's do something for missions. And they gave $45,000 that first year for missions. God gave us a new decorated auditorium. This is putting God first. And if you want God, and you won't do it just to get God to bless, but God just automatically blesses. We got a new budget that will go into effect September 1. You have the privilege of letting me help you select anything out of this budget that amounts to $8,200,000 is the new budget for 82-83. If you'd like to support a national worker, you know, that's $120 minimum, but you know, we can do a lot more than that. But I want you preachers to promise something for your church and then include your promise with it and just pay it into your church. If you want to build a building, you can build a building for 2,000 up to 100,000. You say, I can't give 100,000, but you would let me take your 5,000 and I believe every church in Chicago Metro, now pardon me please, I'm not trying to twist arms or pressure you. You do what God would have you to. But you see, behind every excuse, there's a lack of desire. We generally do what we want to do bad enough. If we want a new car, bad enough, we'll get it. If 
you want a suit of clothes bad enough, you'll get it and worry about paying it later. We live that way. That's the American way. And it's all right. The Bible says, owe no man anything. You don't owe him anything as long as you're making monthly payments and they're on time. You know, you don't owe him anything. That's the way we live. But you can give monthly, $100 a month. Set up your program. There's not a church in this area, I don't believe it's not capable of giving at least $5,000. Some of you give $10,000. Well, you say, well, I'm afraid. Well, promise it anyway by faith. I'd rather try it and fail than not to try it. So just create a need for God to supply. He's the supplier of all. Create it. God will supply. Watching him supply is where the joy comes in. You be the voice of your church. Go back, pastor, to your church and tell them what you've done. Start September 1 through the following camp meeting a year from now work on it as a annual program. It'll surprise you what God will help you to do. So where it says project, if you'd like to build a church, just put church. If you want to support a national worker or three national workers or five national workers, put five national workers. It takes $120 for one, so times five. What it says annually, Put down the total amount. I'll go back to the office and I'll get the project secretary to properly designate. Now, I can do it in a small group like this. If it's too big, I couldn't do it. But I can pretty well see you in my mind and I'm pretty well acquainted with you. And I'll take the top copy back with me and I will personally go with the project secretary and help you. Ladies, you can do something separate or apart of what the priest of the house and the shepherd of the church is going to do, and you can promise separately if you'd like. So put down there annually what you believe your church can do by faith. And if it's a $5,000 church, it may be that you can't build. There's a young fella from Peoria, Illinois, that I just happened to think of before I started preaching. His name is Jake Popejoy. He's the overseer of Scotland and Ireland. Everything we have in Scotland and Ireland are in rented buildings. They're trying to buy a lot in Inverness. I was there in October of last year. It's in the northernmost northern section of Scotland. Did you know we have a pretty good congregation there, the McLaughlins? And they were at the assembly uh, two years ago. A beautiful family. They're in a school building. They've been told that they can't have service much longer in the school building. They showed me a lot. We placed it in the budget for $30,000. If you want to be a part of helping me buy that lot, just put Scotland lot. You say, yeah, I can't for $30,000. Well, you could give five, five, six is 36 of you give 5,000 and Chicago Metro will buy that lot. Wouldn't that be great? That's just a suggestion if you would like to do that. God bless you. Put your name, city, street, state, zip code number on that uh, top copy. Bear down extra firm with a ballpoint pen or pencil, and it'll go all the way through. I'll leave. You can tear out the middle copy, and uh, you can take the third copy with you back to the church. I'll take the original copy with me. So put down there what you will do weekly or monthly or annually, or if you want to give a cash offering this afternoon, that'd be fine. Just route out your check to Church of God. It'll be a part of this camp meeting and the overseer uh, will tally and total it and send it to me later. If you want to put it on this lot, that's just a good suggestion. On the last line says credit, put the name of your church. So we'll be glad to make the proper designation and we'll send you uh, the necessary number for proper uh, designation and it can be properly receipted tear out the middle copy and bring the first and the third copy and put it on the communion table. Thank you for letting me represent this greatest cause in all the world. You've been very kind and tolerant with me. And uh, I may have got on some little sensitive areas, but no apologies. I just spoke to you right out of my heart. God bless you as we sing, Oh, How I Love Jesus again. And if you will come, if you have a cash offering, be fine. If you want to write out a check, just make it out Church of God. We'll take from that check where you're from. We'll tell you later what you promised.
God bless you. Bring it and put it on the table. Here we go. Will you stand? Be sure to get some of the literature before you go out.